pathway. And over here we have the 95% confidence intervals at the end of the table on the right. And we can see that the upper bound of the 95% confidence interval associated with the unstandardized beta weight is 0.651. And because this does not intersect or go beyond 1.0, we would conclude that it is a statistically significant beta weight. Now this is using uh, normal distribution, asymptotic distribution theory to determine the statistical significance. This could be quen questionable. Most people do it. Uh, I think there could be an argument to using alternative approaches to estimating the statistical significance of data that have been derived from uh, non-normally distributed data or uh, data that are not even uh, randomly sampled. I mean, obviously these data are not randomly sampled. Uh, but there are alternative approaches to estimating this. My hunch is that the, the conclusions would be the same. And in, in a future video, I might actually check that out. So beta much lower than 1.0. The volatility is much less in the s and uh, much less in the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio performance annualized. We knew this going into it because the standard deviation, as I reported above, was lower than the S&P 500. In fact, I wonder how much redundancy there is between beta and variance. Uh, I'd like to look into that. I suspect there are papers already published on it. If anyone knows anything, please comment and, and refer it to me. I'd like to read it. Here we have the constant in SPSS, 16.56. This is alpha. Uh, SPSS refers to it as a constant because it's really just the intercept in a general linear regression analysis. What this is saying is that when the x value is equal to 0, when S&P 500 is equal to 0, gives a zero perf uh, annual performance, we can expect Berkshire Hathaway to produce a performance of 16.56. People conventionally conceive or interpret uh, alpha as the expected return uh, above and beyond the index. And we can see here that it's statistically significant because the lower bound 95% confidence interval is, does not intersect with 0. It's 12.525. So this is very statistically significant. Like the 95% the lowest estimate is in the is 12.5% overperformance of the benchmark index. Amazing. But what uh, I found interesting here is that uh, the 16.56 is not the average return in excess that you expect from the Berkshire Hathaway performance if you consider the mean of 21.56 and 10.95. So that's about a 10.5% difference. On average, the outer performance associated with Berkshire Hathaway versus S&P 500 accumulation is about 10, 10.5 when the average return associated with the S&P is about 11. The reason why the alpha here coming out in the regression analysis or the CAPM analysis is 16.56 is because when X is 0, when S&P 500 returns 0, Berkshire Hathaway even more greatly outperforms the index. And this has been a phenomenon associated with Berkshire Hathaway is that it doesn't seem like uh, the performance is very volatile or excessively leveraged or very risky because when the S&P goes down, Warren Buffett's performance might go down as well, but not nearly as much. So this su suggests that there's a nonlinear correlation between the S&P 500 and Berkshire Hathaway, and that's in fact, in fact what the case is. Uh, assumptions associated with the CAPM uh, analysis is that the the residuals associated with the correlation of 0.578 or what people call homoscedasticity associated with the residuals is going to be homogeneous across the S&P 500 x-axis and that's pretty much going to be true because the mean associated with the residual statistics is zero it means there's a nice normal distribution I haven't actually looked at it but my hunch is that's exactly what it's going to be there's going to be a very normal distribution uh, of the residuals associated with the regression analysis in terms of what's left over what the uh, what the uh, uh, the cap M analysis couldn't predict 0.578 is still normally distributed, which is one of the assumptions associated with CAPM. Uh, 
So this is, um, I'm going to end the analysis here. I, I, the only thing I'm going to add is that the, the scatter plot, let me see if I've got enough time to actually do the scatter plot. Let's see if I can beat the um, 15 minute max for YouTube. Okay, we've got S and P, X, Buffett, Y. And here we go. So let me make this smaller. So we get the chart size. Okay, why is that still highlighted? Looks like I've done it twice. Oh, there we go. Okay, so what we've got here is the linear regression of uh, S&P 500 on Warren Buffett's performance. And we can see on this side here, there's a, a slope that's pretty linear. But we can see in the lower end that Warren Buffett's performance doesn't go down. The slope doesn't continue downwards along with the S&P. There's, there's some drag here that's pulling it upwards. Uh, and this is why when X, when S&P is zero, Warren Buffett performance is somewhere in the, in the 16 ballpark. But on average, the S&P doesn't yield zero. It yields about 11%. And over here, and, um, the estimate of, uh, Warren Buffett's performance when on average, is more greatly is more is more accurate estimating based on the means. I don't know why people use alpha only. It seems like that could be uh, misleading when the relationship is nonlinear. Anyway, that's uh, that's the end of this video. Hope you enjoyed it, and I hope people provide comments on on some of the uh, questions I asked about this. Uh, it's about the video. Thanks. Bye.